Hey there, and welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor Josh, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. Let's jump right in. So I have a confession to make. Is that a bad thing? I have a confession to make? I have a confession to make. Um, about 90% or more of all the bubble gum I have ever chewed, I have swallowed. <laughs> I have swallowed it. I do not take the time to spit it back into the wrapper that I had already thrown out and nicely and neatly throw it into the garbage can and dispose of it. I just swallow it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you the reason why I swallow my bubble gum. I'm going to tell you straight out. One is because my parents told me not to. <laughs> my parents told me, if you swallow your bubble gum, it is going to be stuck in your stomach for seven years. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I'm going to keep it right there because it tastes good. I'm going to hold on to that piece of gum for seven. Listen, let me tell you something. It's a lie. It's a lie. Bubble gum does not stay in your stomach for seven years if you swallow it. And if you're telling your kids that stuff, you're a liar. Just tell them to spit it out if you want them to spit it out. But swallowing it does nothing to their body. It's an absolute lie. It will disintegrate and break down just like the steak that you ate for dinner. My point with telling you that is, one, I just wanted to stand on my soapbox and tell you that I swallowed my bubble gum and come clean. But secondly... There's a lot of things that are in your brain. There's a lot of things in your mind that you have been told over the years that are simply not true. Simply not true. At least 75% of the news that you watch daily is simply not true. Every single, I promise you, every single image that you look at in a magazine or online is a lie. It has been photoshopped, it has been altered, it is not a real image. If you're a guy who's going to the gym and you're working out because you want to look like the guy on your protein shake bottle, that dude don't drink that protein. I promise you that dude don't drink that protein. He's never drinking that protein. He gets paid to be on the bottle and you will never look like him by going to the gym. You won't. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. There's a lot of things that are in your brain that are simply lies. Today we're talking about the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Ephesians 6, 17 says this, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I wish Paul would have broke this down a little bit more for us. I wish he would have gone in great detail to tell us, take the helmet of salvation this way. This is how you do it. It would make my job a lot easier and, and I would have a lot less study if he just told us. But we have to go in and look at this stuff, right? In 1 Thessalonians 5.8, he also tells us, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of of salvation. So in two different passages, Paul equates the helmet or salvation to a helmet. The helmet wasn't like all the other pieces of armor. Uh, it was a really thick, heavy piece of metal. It was ornate. It was decorative. Here's what I want you to know about the armor. Let's just say this together. It is the armor of... It does not say it's the armor of Mike or the armor of Bobby. Huh? It's the armor of God. It is God's. He provides it for us, and it is of God. The armor of God. So salvation is not of ourselves. Salvation is of God. The helmet of salvation. It was a fascinating and beautiful piece of armor. It was outrageously gaudy. It was gaudy. It was almost ridiculously gaudy. Um, it was more of a piece of artwork than a helmet. 
rather than just being a, a simple piece of metal formed to fit the head, the soldier's helmet was highly decorated with all sorts of engravings and etchings. Many times they would look like an elephant's head or a horse's head or, or some kind of other animal's head. Sometimes it would have like fruit engraved in it, like, like a, um, grapes or something like that. So think about how odd these helmets would be, right? And it, it would almost look like something that was supposed to be in Mardi Gras down on, uh, you know, Bourbon Street kind of thing. Really ordinate. They had these huge plumes that would come out of the top with brightly colored feathers or horse hair that stood straight up on top of the helmet. If the helmet was going to be used in a public ceremony, the plume would even be more outrageous, sometimes hanging all the way down to the bottom of the back. Very, very long hair coming out of this helmet. The helmet was made out of bronze and equipped with pieces of armor that were specifically designed to protect the cheeks, the jaw, and the back of the neck. The helmet would come down and guard the back of the neck. Because the helmet was so extremely heavy, say heavy. Because the helmet was so extremely heavy and such thick steel, the inside of the helmet would be covered in a spongy, soft material as to it not affect the soldier's head. Can I throw something out to you today that your salvation is not a light matter? That your salvation isn't something to be taken lightly, but that salvation is a heavy matter? Have you guys ever heard the story of the chicken and the pig? Nobody's heard the story of the chicken and the pig. Chicken and the pig walking down the street together, buddies, friends. Walking down the street, chicken and the pig, and they see these young kids who are starving. Starving, need food. So the chicken comes up with a great idea. The chicken says, hey pig, let's provide for them some eggs and bacon that they can eat and that they may be satisfied. <laughs> Chicken's all about it. The pig says, hey, we need to think about this. We need to talk this out. He's like, what's to talk about? This kid's starving to eat. Pig says to the chicken, it's a little sacrifice for you. It's a life sentence for me. See, salvation to us was very easy. With the heart, man believes. With the mouth, confession is made to, unto salvation. But it cost Jesus his life. And it cost the father a son. It's heavy. That's a heavy deal. We don't need to take that lightly. Right? It's a serious situation. It's something that we need to contemplate. Something we need to consider. But it was not just heavy. It was thick. It was a thick piece of steel that came down past the neck. Because in this time, their opponents or their, their, their enemy would carry on something called a battle axe. A battle axe. And if that neck wasn't covered, that battle axe was going to make some heads roll. I got to tell you something about this too. Your salvation is thick. Your salvation is thick. You don't have a wimpy temperamental salvation. That salvation that you were given to by God can withstand some assault. Mm, yeah, I know. Mm, you're not happy with that. That's strange. Strange that we're not happy that our salvation is impenetrable. As if we want to believe that our salvation's thin and brittle. Now listen, just because I said we need to take it seriously doesn't mean that we also need to believe that our salvation is thin and brittle. Can we just think logically for a second? A logical thought? An intentional God who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it that, that, that knows how many bones you have in your body, that created your reproductive organs that you can create life. Do you think that he was caught off by, in surprise that we were going to mess up even after salvation? 
And if he's that logical and he's that systematic and he's that intentional, do you think that he would have given his son as a sacrifice if we could mess it up? I know I wouldn't. I know I wouldn't. It's not... Paul uses this helmet on purpose to show the tenacity and the strength of our salvation. It is not penetrable by the battle axe of the enemy. Oh, this is so good. So why was the Holy Spirit compared to this? Why would the Holy Spirit compare our helmet to this outrageously gorgeous and bright and flashy helmet? I'm just going to tell you that our salvation should stand out. Our salvation should stand out. Your salvation is the most gorgeous and most intricate, most elaborate and most ornate gift that God has ever given you. Your salvation is flashy. It's flashy. The Bible says that Christians will be known by their fruit. Isn't it ironic that sometimes they'd have fruit engraved in their helmets? That salvation was something that's like, man, there's something different about you. You kind of stand out. When everyone else is sad, you got, you got joy. Like, man, that's something different about this person. Amen. See, your salvation should stand out. Now, if you've been raised in church, you've been indoctrinated by religion, what you just heard through your filter and your lenses were, they're going to look at my good works and my good deeds. That's not what flashy, outrageous looks like. That's not what he's saying here. Can, can I paint a picture for you for a second? I'm going to show you what the problem is in church today. Globally. Globally. Ready? Is that here's the posture of a lot of Christians. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. If the Lord wills, I'll be here next week. We'll worship together. Not for nothing. Not for nothing. But when he talks about the Lord's army, he wasn't talking about an army of losers. If you put on the most ornate, the most sophisticated, the most flashy armor, how are you going to stand in that armor? Chest coming out. Shoulders are coming back. Heads up. Listen, listen, I was a youth pastor for many, many years. And teenagers would graduate from my teen group and they would go to the Army or they would go to the Marine. Normally it would be the Marines. The Marines would come back and they wouldn't come to church in their fatigues or their day outfit or whatever it's called. No, they were coming in their dress blues. Right? And when that kid, that guy or the girl that were, went to the Marines for a year, come back to visit, how are they walking into this room? They're walking in their dress blues. They got their hat on. They got their shoulders back because they've been taught, you are the tip of the spear of the arrow. You are the elite of the elite. And it does something for their posture and they walk in a certain way. That's what makes it flashy. That's what makes your salvation stand out is when you have a confidence in your salvation. When you are confident that you are saved and that you belong to the Lord. Many of us aren't. Many of us are not confident in our salvation because, because even when we go to evangelize, this is how we want to evangelize. Do you mind if I have a moment of your time? Sure, what's up? If you were to die today, would you stand before the Lord? And I bet half this room right now be like, oh, dang, I don't know. I don't know if I died right now if I'd be standing before the Lord. Well, why do, how, how, how don't you know? Well, because I said a bad word this week. Like, I said a bad word this week. I mean, you know, because when I was raised, if I said a bad word, then I had to come to the front. I had to get saved again. I had to give my life to Jesus Christ. And if I didn't do that, then I was going to burn. Like, I got saved on Sunday, but I was burning on Monday. <laughs> Where's the confidence in salvation? Where's the confidence in salvation? There isn't. There isn't. So we're not walking around 
Like, so man, I had this one Marine kid. He went to, he went away. He went, I was this little punk kid. He went away, comes back. He got his outfit on. He comes up to me. He's like, oh, Pastor Mike, I can take you now. <laughs> and I says, son, let me tell you something. There's a difference between man muscle and boy muscle. You still got boy muscle. You got a nice suit on, but you still got boy muscle. I'll still whoop your tail. <laughs> but he was confident. He was confident because he's now a trained killer. He's a trained killer, and he had confidence in it. And he was flaunting, and he was going. And I'm so happy for him because I watch a lot of Christians. I, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if God loves me. I don't know. I don't know if healing is for today. I don't, I don't know if deliverance is for today. I don't know if the joy of the Lord is my strength. I, ain't nobody looking to you to be like that. Ain't nobody saying, dude, that's flashy. That's attractive. I want to be like that. We got this idea that that is equated to humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking less often of yourself. <laughs> but I still love me some me. Huh? You still should still love you. All right, I'm moving on. When a person is confident in their salvation, they walk in a powerful reality of what that means for them. And that is noticeable. That's noticeable. Listen, I'm not just like, I'm not just a confident person in, in life, but like, I'm confident in my salvation. I'm confident in my salvation. And that looks different. Do, do you know why most people aren't attracted to you? Why you don't easily make friends? My, my, why people may, may, maybe think that you're standoffish? Do you know why? Because when you walk through the mall or you're out in public, you probably don't have your head up and your shoulders back and looking people in the eye. You're probably... This isn't approachable. This doesn't make friends. You got friends in here, but you don't got friends right here. I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying, if you think that you have a hard time making friends or, or people think you're not approachable, put your head up, put your shoulders back, and look people in the eye. My wife tells me I attract all sorts of crazy. You know, because when I'm walking around, I look people right in their eyes. And so, like, all the people who were, like, selling solar panels all over town or whatever, they were like, hey, man, you ever buy solar panels? I already got them, thanks. But why do they talk to me? Because I looked them in the eye. I gave them some attention. Well, I, yeah, I don't want that. I don't want them to talk to me. Listen, then just learn no. You want solar panels? No. You want Chick-fil-A? No. I'm not being nasty. No, thank you. Do a smile. No, thank you. But like, the shoulders back, chest out. You're somebody. You're somebody. You were born with a price. You're the son of God. You're the daughter of God. It means something. Your salvation is noticeable. It, your salvation is noticeable. The, the, the word for helmet here is a compound word, and it talks about a helmet that is secure and wraps the head. Secure and wraps the head. It was important. It was important that the helmet was secure and it wrapped the head because when the enemy would come with that battle axe, if it wasn't in place, heads were going to roll. Heads were going to roll. That helmet came down and protected the back of the neck. If a Roman soldier didn't have his helmet on when he went out to fight, he was going to lose his head. It was something designed, this helmet was something designed to save your head. This entire series, we've been talking about the battlefield in your mind. In your mind. The enemy tries to attack your mind. Why? Because the battle over your spirit is already lost. When you become a child of God, your spirit becomes alive unto God. It is perfected. You are on your way to heaven. That battle's lost. 
But if he can make your life a living hell now, then the only thing you have to look forward to is heaven. So you're going to be miserable to other people. You're going to hurt your kids. You're going to hurt your spouse. Many of us, many of us, we're hurting everybody around us because we don't got our heads right. We don't got our heads right. Man, we're carrying grudges from 20 years ago. You, how exhausting. Like, I feel sorry for you. How exhausting. How exhausting is that? Yeah, but you don't understand what I went through. You don't understand what Jesus went through for you. To have freedom and liberty and joy and peace, it means something. It means something, all right? If your salvation is like a helmet and it's not worn tightly around your head, then when the enemy comes at you with chopping thoughts, you're going to begin to lose your head. When he begins to chop at your spiritual foundation, trying to tell you healing isn't for today, or that peace of mind isn't for today, or that you're not a Christian, or you lost your salvation because you lost your cool. I'm just going to tell you, if you've ever used the words like, and you call yourself a Christian to somebody else who says they're a Christian, yo, like you were literally used by the devil. You literally did what, like Peter is talking to Jesus. He's like, yo, you don't have to die on the cross. Don't do that. And Jesus looks back and says, get behind me, Satan. You don't speak of the will of God. You speak of the voice of the devil. Like literally, when you do that, when you become the accuser of someone else's salvation, you picked up a battle axe of the enemy and hit another Christian. The helmet of salvation is fixed in place. Why? Listen, why, why, why? Put something on the screen. Our intellectual understanding and comprehension of salvation and all that it encompasses must be ingrained in our minds. Let me explain this because I have no idea how to say that in Spanish. <laughs> I know nosotro, nuestro, nuestro, there we go. And then salvación. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our intellectual understanding and comprehension of salvation and all that it encompasses must be ingrained into our minds. If you do not understand and comprehend the depth, the width, the height, the breadth of your salvation, then it can be attacked. Wow. All right, let, let's just look at this. Yo, man, I got to tell you, that's the ugliest orange shirt I've ever seen in my life. Yo, isn't that the ugliest orange shirt you've ever seen in your life? Huh? Is that the ugliest orange shirt you've ever seen in your life? It is? Oh, man, he's with me. He said, that's the or ugliest orange shirt. Now, does that affect you at all? Why? Because you're not wearing an orange shirt. <laughs> it's just so false, so far out. Like, dude, it's a black shirt. You colorblind? But if I can convince him that he looks ugly today, because I said his shirt was ugly. It didn't matter that I said orange shirt. He's like, yeah, you know, I wasn't sure if I should put this on today. And I, but you got me, because I was really contemplating what I should do, so I should put a blazer on. I do look ugly, don't I? Man, I knew I looked ugly when I looked in the mirror this morning. I should have did my hair differently, too. Boom. A complete lie that made no logical sense could ruin his day. Happens all the time about our salvation. Man, if you were really a Christian, if you were really a Christian, you'd be over that already. If you were really a Christian, if you really got saved, all things would be passed away. You'd never have a struggle again. Dude, we still live in the world. We still live in the world. We are not of the world, but we are living in it. And there are things that come all the time against us. There are things that come at our minds. Listen, and before, and before you judge someone else who sins differently than you, just know that the judgment that's on your face is already sin. It's already sin. You're not, you, you're not set as the holy judge of everyone's behavior. What we're talking about today is the protection of your own salvation, the protection of your own mind. God 
gave his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever, whoever, whoever believes in him. Now, we don't want to really get down and dirty as to whoever's whoever. Because we really only want whoever to be whoever looks like me. Whoever speaks my language. Whoever sins the way that I sin. But, but whoever believes in me definitely could not be, you know, someone from a different kind of community. Whoever believes in me will not perish, but have eternal life, which is salvation, sozo, sozo, salvation, all-encompassing salvation, whoever believes in me. Listen, and then we stop there, but we got to read the very next verse. For Christ, for Jesus, did not come into the world to condemn the world, but through him we might be saved. Salvation, sozo again. The helmet of salvation is impenetrable from the enemy's attack. Mm, this is some good stuff, all right? Now listen, the Bible has these three words that I want to look at. Three words, wiles, devices, and deception. When we're talking about the enemy trying to attack the mind, there's three words, wiles, it says that I don't want you to be ignorant of the wiles of the devil or stand therefore to quench the fiery darts of the wiles of the enemy. Uh, there's devices, how he's going to try to do it, and then there's deception. Let's first look at the word wiles. The word wiles, when broken down to its root, means with a road. With a road. Now, we understand this, that if there's a road, that every road leads somewhere, right? Every road leads somewhere. We take a road to get somewhere. Where do you think this road that the enemy is trying to create is going to go? Your mind, okay? He's trying to get a road into your mind. Check this out in 2 Corinthians 2.11. For we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. If we break the word devices down to its root, uh, this phrase should say this. We are not ignorant of the mind games that the devil tries to pull on us. So the devices that he's trying to do are mind games. So he's trying to create a road to play a mind game. A road to a mind game, okay? Now watch. When we put these two words together, he works with a road. Where is the road headed? It's headed for your brain. And if the devil can get a foothold in your brain, he's going to pull a device. He's going to start messing around with your mind. Okay, then we have this word called deception. Deception means to deceive with a purpose. If you are ever under attack from the enemy, it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. You're not accidentally under attack. If there is really no purpose behind the attack, you're probably not under attack. You probably made a bad decision. Can we be for real? Right? There would be a purpose, that, that you were on a mission, you were doing something great, and then all of a sudden, bam, there's this attack that happens. This word can be found throughout the New Testament in different verses. It talks about the devil's perceptible ability, how he deceives with purpose. All right, so let me put this all together for you. The word wiles means with a road. The road is headed for your mind. If the devil can beat down the believer's resistance, if he can try to get through that helmet, he's going to play a mind game on you. Once the mind game is in full motion, then the enemy wants to bait your mind with an accusation. He wants to bait your mind or deceive you with a belief that you are not good enough for God. You're not enough. And I would dare say if you've ever dealt with a poor self-image, the lie of the record that's played over and over and over in your mind is you're not enough. You're not enough as a wife. You're not enough as a husband. You're not enough at your job. You're not enough financially. You're just not enough. You need to do better. You need to do more. This is that deception that comes in. And, you know, and then we use it against each other. We do. We use it against each other all the time. When we get into fights with our spouses, that's the one that we push on. That's the one we push on. 
You don't give me enough attention. You're not here enough. We don't talk enough. We don't go on vacation enough. Enough, 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 enough. And this record's playing over and over and over and over and over again. And this is where it comes from. This is why Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And I got to tell you, this is not the job of the helmet of salvation. This is our job. It's our job to put the helmet in its place, but then cast down imagination. Does that thing that just came to my mind line up with the Word of God? Is what I just heard from God or from the devil? And I think that, honestly, church at large has screwed us up. Because, because we'll, hear some, we'll hear an accusation. We'll hear an, accuse, uh, an accusation towards something that we did wrong. And we'll say, yep, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, really? I mean, because it could also be the accuser of the brethren. I'll tell you right now, a child of God, the only conviction you're going to get is a reminder of your righteousness. Any other negative thought that you feel that's coming against you is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I mean, listen, I told you this. I told you spiritually you're perfected. Spiritually you're perfected. The only thing that the Holy Spirit can remind you of is your righteousness. Everything else is a teaching of behavior. Listen, you feel bad about something because you violated your moral compass. You have a conscience. Don't get those two confused. Don't get your spirit confused with your conscience. Because your conscience can be seared with a hot iron. Your conscience can be corrupted. Your spirit cannot. You can be taught something's wrong that's not wrong and it make you feel bad that you did it because you violated your conscience. But the Holy Spirit will never do that. Your spirit will never do that. It takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of effort. What am I hearing? What's coming in? Is this me? Is this God? Or is this the devil? And taking some time. Okay, well, what does the Scripture say? What does the Scripture say about what I'm feeling? Here's what happens. Here's what happens. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The word strongholds was originally used for the word fortress, but it can also be used for the word prison. And in the next two minutes, I am going to attempt to talk to you about two types of strongholds that try to come into your mind when, when the helmet's not in its right place. Rational strongholds, and irrational strongholds. The dangerous thing about rational strongholds is that it comes from the word logismo, logismos, which is where we get the word logic. Rational strongholds are the hardest to deal with because they usually make sense. It usually makes sense that you're afraid of that or that you don't want to do that or you can't do that or that, that, that makes sense. And people who call themselves thinkers or intellectuals are prone to fall prey to rational strongholds because they're rational thinkers anyway, and they're naturally inclined to allow their minds to dominate them. Here's the problem. Faith is not of the mind, it's of the spirit. So thinkers, intellectuals have a hard time operating in faith because faith doesn't make sense because faith is not of the mind. Faith is of the spirit. Irrational strongholds primarily have to do with fears and worries that are completely unrealistic. And it's easy for anybody to walk by and be like, dude, that doesn't even make any sense. But to the person who's in it, it's very real. It's very real. Irrational strongholds are so ridiculous that finally you'll wake up one day from the trick of the enemy and be like, I don't even know why I was worried about that. But in the moment, it's a very real stronghold. If these thoughts persist in your mind and insist on controlling you mentally and emotionally, they'll try to get a root in you. 
They'll try to get a foundation in you. And although maybe you tore that stronghold down like, ah, yeah, that was foolish. There's still a foundation there that it can easily get built back up. This is why Paul tells in 2 Corinthians 10.5, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You've got to make that thing bow down. You've got to get that thought to bow down. You've got to take control of those thoughts. Grab a hold of it. I'm not thinking about this. Stop it. This is ridiculous. Get out of my head. I'm not doing this. And, and be weird. Like, go look at yourself in the mirror. Say, stop right now. Stop right now. Treat yourself like a little kid. From the spirit of who, listen, I got to do this to myself. I got to do this to myself. I will stand in the mirror, and from the spirit of who I am, I got to speak to the head of who I am. And be like, listen, listen, get your thoughts right right now. Get it, get it, get it right right now. This is not of God. He says, bring every thought into captivity. Make it come into subject, subjection to the word of God. But I got to tell you this, your thoughts are not going to be taken captive easily. And if you've never practiced self-discipline over your thoughts or your emotions, it's a long road. It's a long road. I'm just going to be daddy for like two seconds. Like if you were the kid that was allowed to kick and scream in the you know, grocery store, ah, you're screaming, you're making a whole scene, and your parents never smacked your butt, it's going to take a little bit harder time for you to get control of your emotions as an adult because you're never taught how to do it. My mom and dad had this amazing talent of hitting the reset button. Wow! <laughs> Hit that reset button, snap me right out of that. Hey! All right, anyway, you get what I'm saying? I'm not talking about abusing your kids whatsoever. All I'm saying is if you've never been taught how to create mental discipline or personal discipline or creating systems and habits in your life that are healthy and proficient, it's a little bit harder to do it because they don't want to come into captivity. All right? Listen, a stronghold that is not torn down eventually becomes oppression. Oppression. And you will have emotional or mental oppression. Oppression can very easily and quickly look like possession. It's not the same, but it can look the same. There are people who are so emotionally oppressed, so emotionally depressed that it looks almost satanic because it has such, such emotional roots dug down deep in their life. You got to begin etching away at those strongholds in your life, reminding yourself of who you are in Christ. Remind that you have the helmet of salvation and that that salvation is in place and that nothing can get through that in your life. But here's the deal about the helmet of salvation. You don't get the helmet of salvation until salvation. <laughs> you don't have to guard over your thoughts and over your mind until you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, until you become a child of God. And here at Family Church, we'd love to offer that to you today. If you're watching online, we'd love to offer that to you as well. And here's what the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10. It said, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. With the heart, man believes. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We would love to offer that to you today with this simple prayer. Would you join with me? Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you fill out one of our connect cards in one of those chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you? Would you just wave at me real quick and say, Pastor Mike, that was me. I prayed that for the first time today. Anybody has to look across the room real quick? Yeah, I see you. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody real quick as I'm looking? All right. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, I see you. 
We have that same book available to you with one of our ushers or our care team members. Just, just come up to them and say, hey, I raised my hand today. They'll give you that six-day devotional. Please do that. Like, get started in that walk with the Lord. Uh, give us your, let us have your contact information. We can pair you up with one of our care team members and can help you and coach you along your walk with the Lord. If you came today and you need prayer for any reason, we will have care team members in the front and at the high top tables in the back to pray with you at the conclusion of service. Father, we thank you today for this word, reminding us of our salvation, gift from you, the gift of grace of our salvation. Help us to take it serious. Help us to understand the weight of what you did for us, the importance of that. Help us to walk in your grace and your mercy every day. Lord, I pray today, I do pray today, that there was no misunderstanding as to what I was preaching. Our salvation is important. Our salvation is solid. Our salvation cost your son his life. But Father, we also know that our salvation is impenetrable. It cannot be taken away because you gave it to us. We did not earn it of our works. Fathers, leave here today. We thank you that this truth resounds in our hearts and is deep in our hearts. I thank you that we are blessed. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at familychurchny.com to get started today.